sitting volleyball, swimming, track and field, and wheelchair basketball. The competition kicked off last night with a spectacular opening ceremony at the U.S. Olympic Training Center. For more, we join Petty Officer Brandy Wills, who is part of our team coverage at the Games. You're right, Sergeant Usher. I am here at the United States Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs, and last night's opening ceremony was quite a sight to see. Go ahead and take a look. As the Warrior Games torch was lit, you could see it in their faces, the magnitude of this event and the work it took to get here. It's um, the sports here for Wounded Warriors and competing is the best therapy for me. Uh, it makes me feel like I'm normal and it makes me feel like I still make a difference. 200 athletes trained hard and made it through trials to earn a spot to compete here in Colorado Springs. Many, like retired airman Stephen Mallets, in multiple events. I played volleyball growing up, standing. Uh, so coming into a sitting volleyball sport was, was an adjustment, but I love it. Um, I've never thrown shot put or discus, but here I am competing in the games with it. So it was uh, it's taking a shot full of a, <laughs> of a lot of track and field practice. And um, swimming, I've just, I don't know, I've always been a pretty good swimmer, so here I am. Here in this place, the hallowed halls of the U.S. Olympic Training Center, where America's elite athletes train. Looking at all the people who's been here, they compete in the Olympics and they come here to train, I am honored to be here to train as they are. This is the Olympic Training Center. Like people dedicate their lives to get here and, and all for one event or one moment in time where they can be the great. Um, it's, it's so humbling. I mean, just seeing the rings. You know, it was, um, it was definitely uh, eye-opening, you know, especially, you know, you're walking down, down the hallways and stuff, you're passing Olympic athletes you've seen, seen on TV at Sochi. So that's, that gives you goosebumps as it is. And that was just a look at what happened last night. Today, coming up on Adaptive Warrior, we're going to take a look at the results from last night's sitting volleyball event and so much more. So we're going to go back to you in the studio, but tune in. Thank you. In other news, we are taking a look at the absentee voting week. It's a chance for the Defense Department to give service members, their spouses, and overseas citizens a chance to get to know the absentee voting process more. Overseas, as this November 4th midterm election nears, officials are reminding anyone of voting age to register online and request an absentee ballot if needed. If you need help navigating the process or want to check a state's re requirements, head to fvap.gov. And Coast Guard officials say life jackets saved the lives of seven boaters whose boat was capsized by strong currents Saturday off the coast of Sanibel Island, Florida. Officials say four adults and three children were pulled from the water after their boat's engine stopped working and then tipped over. The group was taking part in a children's fishing tournament when the accident happened. Stay with DOD News for complete coverage of the 2014 Warrior Games and to check out the medal count, head to teamusa.org or search Warrior Games on Facebook. Coming up later today at 1700 Eastern, watch Hiring America, military spouses within Hilton Reservation Customer Care Division discuss the difficulties they've had holding jobs and finding meaningful careers in the past and the impact and value the work from home program has had on their lives. Then at 1800 Eastern, watch Troop Talk. The SEAC, Sergeant Major Brian Battaglia, addresses suicide prevention and gives his thoughts on how troops are never off duty. Be sure to check out the DOD Facebook page for the latest from the 2014 Warrior Games in Colorado Springs. Watch for us also on Twitter. I'm Staff Sergeant Chad Usher. Keep it right here for the latest in DOD news.
We are live at Fort Carson here in Colorado Springs. Cycling is underway, but we'll have more for you later on in the show. And I'll be here at the United States Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs, Colorado, all week, bringing you live updates from the Warrior Games. So stay tuned. Welcome to beautiful Colorado Springs, Colorado. It is a wonderful sunny day here. It may look empty behind me, but that's because most of the action is happening at Fort Carson. So we're here as promised to bring you updates from yesterday's Warrior Games. So let's take a look back. Now the opening ceremony was held and an athlete from each service passed the torch before officially lighting the Olympic torch. In round one of sitting volleyball, Air Force won over Army 2-1 and Navy beat the Marines 2-0. Air Force kept on in round two, topping SOCOM 2-1, but Team Marines came back and beat Navy with a 2-0 win. Now, Warrior Games, they aren't only being held here, as I said, at the Olympic Training Center, but they're also being held in Fort Carson, where we have MC2 Lori Bent. MC2, how are things going there? Well, you know, we've been here all day and we've seen these cyclists come out and put it all out there while they're riding in their perspective events. We've seen recumbent, we've seen hand cycling, and we've seen the bicycle events. Right now, actually, tandem is, is going on. Any minute now, you'll see some athletes fly through here. The tandem cycling event is actually a two-man two bicycle event with a visually impaired athlete on the back led by a pilot. It is amazing and the fans are out here supporting their teams, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps and Special Ops. Back to you. Thank you so much, MC2. We'll be talking to you again a little more later. But first, yesterday after the closing ceremonies, I had the opportunity to sit down with General Douglas Robb and Command Master Chief Terry Prince from the Defense Health Agency. And we wanted to talk a little bit about what DHA brings to Warrior Games and adaptive sports as a whole. So let's take a look back. Sir, uh, you are the director of the Defense Health Agency. So could you please tell us, for those of us who don't know, a little bit about the agency and what it does? Absolutely. The Defense Health Agency stood up one year ago, almost to the date here, 1 October 2013. And uh, our job is to... Surgeon Generals, so they can again present those forces to the combatant commanders and their service chiefs. So we are a joint first solution enabler for our combatant forces. All right, and can you talk a little bit about the advancements in the quality of care that our service members receive from the battlefield to home? Absolutely. In fact, I think it's kind of exciting for me to be here and also the Command Master Chief as a lot of those folks out there uh, at, at one time a couple years ago, you know, our young corpsmen, our medics, and our uh, folks, you know, whiskeys and deltas out there were saving their lives on the battlefield. And then, uh, you know, our trauma system kicked in. And uh, as you know, our advances in, uh, in combat casualty care forward and our en route care has allowed these soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, coast guardsmen, our coalition forces and our civilians to come safely back home to their husbands, their wives, mothers, fathers, sons and daughters. Command Master Chief, can you talk a little bit about the care that they get once they get here? Oh, I'm proud to talk about the care. As the former Command Master Chief of the Walter Reed National Military Medical Center at Bethesda, I was often at the gates to meet the wounded warriors when they come through our hospital. And uh, in many cases, uh, tears flowing down the family's faces, and you just give them hugs, and you'd say, your son or daughter is going to walk out of here. In three months, nine months, or one year, they will walk out of this hospital. Some of them on bionic limbs that they can, they can control with their mind. I mean, they don't want to believe that when they see the care and the dedication of our military, our GS and our contract people working at our medical facilities all around the world, not just at Bethesda. The quality of life and the quality of care go hand in hand. And I think if you got any of the wounded, ill and injured on this set, they would say the same thing. It's proud to serve. And the Defense Health Agency is a, is a mix of all the services, including the public health service. And so we have the best of all the services working in one area, all for the betterment of that soldier, sailor, airman, marine, coast guardsman on the front lines. I wouldn't ask for a better job in the world. Thanks for asking. 
And can you talk a little bit, sir, about DHA's role within Warrior Games? Absolutely. Uh, one of the uh, things that uh, we uh, bring, as we say, bring to the fight, of course, is the uh, military uh, adaptive sports program uh, that's uh, with Wounded Warrior Care and Policy. And so our folks work together in the Defense Health Agency along with Health Affairs, again, to make this, this uh, program happen. And I, I just think it's exciting because I call it like the, the bookends. And, you know, we talked about a little bit ago about our tactical combat casualty care. That's on the front end, saving these young men and women's lives. Or say if you're in an accident here stateside, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, an industrial accident or a car accident or a sporting accident. And then, then what happens is our system kicks in uh, to take care of them and, and, and to stabilize them and then to bring them forward. And when I think about the folks that we have on the battlefield, so within 20 minutes we have a, a, a medical evacuation helicopter that picks them up, takes them to their first surgery. And then, and then within hours after that, they're stabilized. And then a C-130 will then take them to another hospital where they'll get further stabilization. And then within 24 hours, within 24 hours, they can be waking up at Launchville Regional Medical Center or they can be waking up at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center. And the first time they wake up, after maybe one or two helicopter rides, a C-130 ride, two C-17 rides, ICU level care in the air, two or three surgeries en route, 24 or 36 hours later, first time they wake up, their husband or wife, their mother or their father, their son or their daughter are holding their hands. Now that's the way you heal. That's the way you heal. And what you see in the audience there is that same family unit that's continuing that healing process to allow these folks to be great citizens, great soldiers, great airmen, and great Coast Guards, and great Navy. I mean, these it's just awesome to watch these folks. Absolutely. Uh, is there anything else that you gentlemen would like to add? Command Master Chief. Well, I just want to give a shout out to all the NCOs, non-commissioned officers that are taking care of our patients, working hand in hand with our providers. But we're the finest military service in the world because of our non-commissioned officers. And those guys do, those guys and gals do it every day, and I couldn't be prouder. All right. Thank you very much, you. gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be right back with more Adaptive Warrior. Stay tuned. Overseas program provides an overseas, overseas medical, medical pharmacy 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 pharmacy. Pharmacy. If you need contact numbers for your overseas TRICARE provider, visit TRICARE-Overseas.com. Click Contact Us, then select the region where you live. You'll see phone numbers, enrollment addresses, and more. Go to TRICARE-Overseas.com. That's TRICARE-Overseas.com. And that's the bottom line. What was the oldest U.S. battleship to serve in World War II? USS New Jersey, USS Arkansas, USS Montana. USS Arkansas commissioned in 1912. The remaining U.S. battleships were commissioned starting in 1914. The successful amphibious landings at Normandy on D-Day, June 6, 1944, is attributed to the design of the LCVP or landing craft vehicle personnel. Made of plywood and steel, these landing craft were designed to travel in shallow water, getting personnel and equipment ashore. Early versions were undesirable because personnel had to climb out of the boat but later versions showed the ease of storming the beach by designing a bow ramp that dropped down. The LCBP was so successful, General Dwight D. Eisenhower stated without this landing craft, the Normandy invasion would not have been possible. Today, the Navy uses the LCAC, or landing craft air cushion. Traveling on the surface of the water, the LCAC can deliver troops, weapons, equipment, and cargo ashore. The Navy has used the LCAC for amphibious operations since the 1980s. Welcome back. The military health system plays a very important role in adaptive sports and the Warrior Games. Yesterday I had the opportunity to sit down with Dr. Jonathan Woodson, who's the Undersecretary of Defense for Health Affairs, and we got to talk about that very subject. Let's take a look. Sir, could you tell me a little bit about the importance of the military health system and its role in supporting adaptive sports? 
Well, you know, the military health system, I think, is an important enabler of the military services uh, to defend this nation. Uh, where uh, the military goes, so go the providers and all that care for uh, servicemen and women uh, from the battlefield back uh, to the United States. The military adaptive sports program, though, is really special because it's about that commitment to the uh, wounded warrior or the ill and injured that allows them to regain uh, ability. And it really is about ability, regaining ability, so that they can meet the challenges of life. Um, I have recently heard a wounded warrior say, uh, you know, without the military adaptive sport program, uh, uh, there wouldn't be as much hope for the future, but more importantly, as he said, uh, we've learned to kick the ass out of life. And I don't mean to be vulgar, but it's about that healing of the mind, body, and spirit. And that's what the Military Adaptive Sport Program is all about. Uh, it's, uh, it's about folks like we see here today and this week who want to compete at a very high level. But it's also about uh, rehabilitating uh, for recreational uh, efforts. So folks who like to ski, uh, like to swim, uh, like to kayak, like to fish, uh, it's all about uh, restoring them uh, to uh, life in its fullest uh, and uh, allowing them to meet all of the challenges. It's, it's an a essential part of rehabilitation. Now, Dr. Woodson is actually the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs, so I would like to correct myself right there. But those 200 athletes that he was talking about who rise up to the Challenge of Warrior Games have to go through a tryout process. Staff Sergeant Pete Ising will actually take us through a look of the Air Force trials. Let's look at that right now. It's five days of being tested. Early mornings and long days where combat tested warriors come from all over the United States to compete. The only thing on their mind is to prove they deserve to be chosen. Chosen to represent their service and build on their journeys towards recovery. first Warrior Games in 2010, the Air Force had six applications. We have well over 100 athletes here today. Um, that just shows kind of the exponential growth of uh, the Air Force team. So they can show the rest of us what real strength is all about. Typically a team consists of 40 service members. Because the amount of applicants has grown, the coaches of the Air Force team have some tough choices to make. 100 athletes will put their skills to the test, and it won't be easy. It's fierce this year, and we have a lot of really, um, really good new talent coming in. That's a great problem to have, so we're all pretty happy about it. But at the same time, I think, um, I think the athletes are competitive, and they obviously want to make the team if they're here. These athletes are tremendously tough. They've been through a lot, and they bring that here with them. This is an intense process here. Uh, this is a high-level, high-caliber event. It's not just the competition that drives them. Whether it's to prove someone wrong or to prove something to themselves, these athletes want more than being on the Air Force team. After 21 years of service, the only time I feel semi-normal is when I'm around other warriors. Since I've been here, I felt like I'm part of that family again. And they will tell you straight up that, you know, a few months ago, they didn't even want to leave the house. So for them to, to make that transition from being afraid to even leave the house to coming out here, that takes, it takes a tremendous amount of guts. And some of those athletes you just saw are over competing in Fort Carson right now where we have MC2 bent. MC2, do you have an update for us? The tandem men's race just, we're, we're actually waiting on the, la the few last competitors to come through, but SOCOM and Army already crossed the line. We're waiting on Marines, but over to our right, we have the Bicycle Men's Open 
cycle it's warming up in just a few moments you'll probably see them line up right here over my shoulder to begin their race and that's a 30 kilometer race three laps around the warrior game route and then after that the bicycle men's physical disability race will take off so that's the update we have for you for right now back to you Thank you so much, MC2. We have so much more coming up, so stay tuned. Our veterans need you. There are more than 8 million enrollees in health care at the Department of Veterans Affairs. That's more than 2% of the entire U.S. population. This includes veterans from previous generations and veterans from today's wars. Challenging medical conditions, ever-increasing technological breakthroughs, and more returning women than ever before are redefining the type of care VA professionals are providing. Serve those who serve our nation. Provide patient-centered, evidence-based care. Bring your exceptional medical and healthcare skills to the Veterans Health Administration. America's heroes need you. Join the conversation at hashtag work at VA or visit vacareers.va.gov. Welcome back to Adaptive Warrior. Now, two lucky athletes from each service branch are competing throughout the Warrior Games to win the title of ultimate champion. Staff Sergeant Pete Ising tells us just what it takes to win. To understand the triumph of being the 2013 Warrior Games ultimate champion, one must first put it in the proper context. The first vehicle out of four hit a uh, regular ID right broadside uh, right as it passed and then our vehicle which was the third vehicle got a uh, explosively formed penetrating IED. Get up! Get up! Oh, I was knocked unconscious for the first uh, maybe 20, 30 seconds, and when I came conscious, I felt like I was just on the smack inside of a huge mortar firework. You know, that feeling that you get the overblast from fireworks, it, it bothers me to this day, but it felt like I had just exploded inside of it. Besides the constant headaches and back pain from the blast, Mitch was finding it difficult to do everyday things. I felt really slow and I always felt like I had a pretty quick wit and the British contractors and I, we had a lot of fun together but afterwards you know I would talk to them or they'd say like hey man how's it going and I would have to hear what they said and then I'd have to kind of break down the message and figure out what they're trying to say and then I'd have to think about it and think about what I want to say and then I'd respond. And that entire time that I just mentioned is how long it would take for me to think inside just to say, oh, there's nothing, I'm not doing anything. Captain Kiefer was later diagnosed with a traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress disorder. Because of his symptoms, Mitchell would get uncontrollable anxiety, causing him to become easily frustrated. Um, when we were dating, like I said, I didn't know about this disease. I didn't... I have no idea and uh, basically I was dating in my mind a normal guy and I didn't see much of you know the ups and downs and I guess I don't, I don't think he tried to hide it but I don't think he actually realized either that it was that bad. <laughs> you can't see that he's sick but he's really sick and anything will you know turn him like to be mad or sad or upset so if you even if you tell him anything you have to be really careful I try to think that it's he's not trying to be mean to me that he's not um, trying to be hurtful when he said something it's just you know he's probably in that stage when he doesn't really know what's going on sometimes you know you seem saved by the bell right oh my goodness we're gonna have to sit down and have a marathon that's how I learned all my morals and values watching. Captain Kiefer used school, his family, and competition as the fuel to move forward. I had just the motivation to get back to normal as soon as possible. I didn't want to feel like I was at a disadvantage. He's a driven guy. He has, um, that's where pretty much the, 
the main thing that attracted me to him. He's, he set a goal and he doesn't stop until he um, get it done. I never wanted to quit. I just always wanted to figure out the way to get better. One day, he received a call from a friend he met on the Air Force triathlon team that would push him even further. I had heard what happened to him, knew him personally, heard what happened to him when he was uh, in Iraq, and I called him out on the phone. I said, uh, I said, Mitch, have you ever thought about the Warrior Games? And at that point, I hadn't, and he said, well, I'm going to make you the ultimate champion. And I was like, OK, sure, <laughs> whatever that means. To become the ultimate champion at the Warrior Games, an athlete competes in a pentathlon-style event that pits warriors against each other in a variety of disciplines. Points are earned in each discipline, with the athlete collecting the most points being crowned the ultimate champion. Well, in 2013, Mitch did it. Now, he's training to do it again. I'm confident in the Warrior Games. Last year, I basically just still try to train to get on that Air Force triathlon team. I feel a lot more prepared this year. Basically, I have concentrated quite a bit more on power things on the bike. Same thing with the shot put. I'm doing quite a bit of technique work when I can. I think I'm doing going to feel a lot more prepared this year than I did last year. While Mitch is confident about the games, he also said that it's not about winning. It's about recovery. Reporting from Southern Virginia, I'm Staff Sergeant Pete Ising. Sergeant Ising also had the chance to sit down with Charlie Hebner yesterday of the U.S. Olympic, the U.S. Paralympic Committee. What's your, as you've been doing this for a while, what has been your proudest moment throughout this whole process? You know what? Yeah, great question. Thank you. So <laughs> for five years, I've, I've, that question has kind of come forward. And you know what? The proudest moment around this event and these games is every year 200 service members come here. Yeah. Um, usually it's 200 new service members, and the goal is to get them home, get them back to active duty, get them back to life. And uh, the stories and the proudest moments are the 200 young men and women that are impacted, but more importantly, the thousands of young men and women that have served that are reading about the Warrior Games, that are reading about the Invictus Games, that are inspired by it, and just as importantly, their friends and family, because right. that's the key. I mean, you come home and uh, you come home in a wheelchair and friends you grew up with for 20 years at times don't even know how to, they, you know, they're afraid to talk. They to don't them. know how to respond, you know, to that and whole thing. You know what? You skied with them for 20 years as kids, and it's something as simple as sport, something as simple as going skiing again right. that makes all the difference in the world. So, you know, our proudest moments are the proudest moments of the thousands that have participated in the Warrior Games, but more importantly, the thousands back in communities around this country that are using sport to help their rehabilitation, help to return to active duty, and help to return to a productive life. That, that's the proudest moment, hands down. That's all we have time for for Adaptive Warrior today. We'll see you tomorrow when we bring you results from today's events. But first, let's take a look at what's already happened. DOD News is a service of the Defense Media Activity. The following program is sponsored by the United States Army. To learn more, visit GoArmy.com forward slash starting strong. The show you are watching is real. These people are not actors. For the next half hour, you will follow a potential Army recruit with a backstage pass, learning about Army life, careers, and themselves. At the end, they'll make a life-changing decision. Join the Army or remain a civilian. This recruit's journey starts now.